Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those of you joining us from around the world today. And welcome to the Flow Meter Calibration Multivariable Transmitter Webinar Part 2. I'm Katie Turner, Marketing Manager with BMAX Inc., and I will be one of your hosts for today. Also joining us is Sarah Kinnan, BMAX Client Services Manager, and Michaela Cooper, ISA Coordinator um, for Strategic and Foundation Partnerships. Before I hand it over to Sarah, who will introduce our presenters for today, I'd like to let you know how you can participate with us. As you should notice, this webinar does have a video component. Um, and that's because we want to have a conversation with you. We will be sharing a lot of information, but we also want to hear from you. And we'll have two question and answer sessions, um, one about halfway through and one at the end. Because of today's large audience, we will only accept questions um, typed in through the question box on your GoToWebinar nav bar. If you cannot see that question box, you need to go up to the top where it says File, Options, and then after Options, it should say View. Click on View and make sure that the check mark next to Questions is marked so you can enter your questions into the question box. Um, please do not use the chat box. We will be looking for questions in the question box only. There will also be live polls during today's webinar, so um, we will cue you on when to answer those, and you can do that directly on your screen. Finally, at the end, there will be a survey that pops up when the webinar closes, and we'd really like your feedback. Please tell us what you'd like to see next time. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah, who will introduce our presenters for today. Thank you very much, Katie. And uh, I'm not seeing the pictures of the presenters or the slideshow. Maybe it's just me. I'll go ahead and start presenting um, either way. There she is. First off, we have the lovely Nicole Meidel. She is a product management engineer for Emerson's Automation Solutions Business Unit. She has been with Emerson for over two years working with Rosemont Multivariable Transmitters. Her role focuses on product support in areas ranging from new product development to product training. Meidel received a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us today, Nicole. We're really lucky to have you here. Next up, we have the Honorable Ned Espy. He is the technical director with BMEX, and he has promoted calibration management for over 20 years. Ned has, de has helped develop best practices for calibration with a focus on pressure, temperature, and multivariable transmitters. He is a consistent editorial contributor to the leading industry publications and has received significant recognition within the automation industry. Today, Ned teaches calibration best practices and provides technical support to end users and the BMEX team in North America. Next up, we have... Whoa, hey, what? I do not remember getting clearance from my agent to show those pictures. Where did you get those? Um, this might be a WikiLeaks situation. Uh, I wasn't prepared for this. All yeah, right, fine. Is, is there a next slide? Okay. Back on script. Um, now we have Roy Tomolino. You might have seen him before in webinars or ISA and BMX events around the country. He has been teaching calibration management for 15 years. Throughout his career, he has taught on four different continents to people from over 40 different countries. His previous roles include technical marketing engineer and the worldwide trainer for Hewlett Packard, as well as application engineer with Honeywell. Today is responsible. Today, Roy is responsible for tra all BMX training around North America, and that's it for our presenters today. All right, before I hand it over to Nicole to get us started, I want to remind everyone that there was a part one to this series called Differential Pressure Flow Meter 
calibration, and you can access that by visiting isa.org forward slash BMEX um, webinars if you'd like to view that recording. And with that, I'd like to welcome Nicole. All right, thanks, Key. Um, so first I'm going to go through the agenda here. Um, I'm going to go into an introduction of multivariable flow measurement and some myths that uh, come about when measuring with a multivariable transmitter. Um, then Ned's going to go into some recommended calibration me methods with a multivariable transmitter or flow computer. And then Roy's going to give us a live demonstration of this. Then we'll have a quick Q&A session. And then I'm going to dive deeper a little bit into some of uh, multivariable applications. And then I'll pass it back to Ned with some ways to test multivariable in a traditional manner. And then Roy will give us one more demonstration and we'll wrap it up with another Q&A session. So first we're going to go through um, a couple of poll questions to kind of see what kind of audience we have on here today. So the first question we have, pretty basic, what are you using to measure flow? A multivariable transmitter, flow computer, neither, or you're not sure. I'll give you a minute to run through. All right, well this is great to see. Um, it looks like we have a lot of multivariable users, um, and so hopefully we can get a little bit more in depth for you guys. And then some of you who aren't sure or uh, don't use multivariable at all, uh, we can hopefully go into um, enough detail for you as well. And then our next poll question we have, just to get an even better idea of um, what kind of um, people are on the call today. Uh, for those who are currently using a multivariable transmitter, how many uh, measurement points do you have in your process? None, one to five, six to 15, or more than 15? And I'll give you another minute to answer that. All right, so it looks like we have uh, mostly uh, just a couple of multivariable measurement points. So um, after the day, we can hopefully optimize those measurement points for you. So then, uh, now I'll go into my slides here. All right, so first I'm going to go into a basic overview of DP flow, and then I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into multivariable transmitters. The DP flow equation uh, comes from uh, a guy named Bernoulli. Um, when an obstruction in a pipe, such as an orifice placed, is placed, there's a cause of pressure, of pressure differential. Um, by measuring these pressures with known pipe restrictions and geometries, we can calculate the fluid flow rates. In its simplest form, the flow rate equation is equal to the square root of a change in pressure or differential pressure times a K constant. So historically, uh, DP flow is very well known. Um, it consists of impulse piping as well as a DP transmitter as shown in the picture on the right here. Um, it's a well understood technology and has been around for many years. And there are many good things about this traditional installation. Um, it's well recognized globally across many standards. It's highly repeatable, economical, and easily, easily calibrated and configured in the field. But there's some uh, problems with this historical uh, way of measuring DP flow. Um, there's trouble with leak points, um, sometimes trouble with long impulse lines, higher pressure loss, um, and sometimes it can be difficult to install because it requires long straight runs. And one of the most important things that I want to highlight in today's presentation is that there's a lot of flow uncertainty due to varying pressures and temperatures. So uh, now I'm going to go into another uh, poll question here. Do you think taking a DP measurement is accurate enough for your flow rate? All 
All right, this is almost great for me to see. Um, half of you think this is accurate enough and half of you don't. So I'm sure it varies a lot based on what your fluid and your, um, your application really is. But today I want to really dive deeper into um, why uh, I think this is a myth. So we'll move into our next slides here. So I believe that taking a, a DP flow measurement is not accurate enough. Um, the reason why I think this is that the K constant is assumed. Um, not only are you not taking into consideration anything that goes into the K constant, you're also not taking into consideration the density. Both of these things change with different pressures and temperatures. You can see here um, on the graph on the bottom um, right is the accuracy that you are getting when not taking into consideration any changes in pressures and temperatures. I'm going to go a little bit more into depth on what actually goes into the flow rate equation, um, as you can see on the left. And um, hopefully we can uh, debunk the fact that taking a, just a DP measurement is accurate enough for your flow rate. So you can see here that original DP flow equation that I popped up on the screen in the first slide. You have a, a K constant times the square root of DP. Now, um, to take into consideration some of the changes in pressures and temperatures, you can add the density term to this. So how does one do this? Some of you may do this as well. Um, you do this by taking additional pressure and temperature measurements. Um, you have a separate differential pressure transmitter, a separate static pressure temperature, and a separate uh, process temperature transmitter. Um, all these three separate measurements make your reading more accurate than just a DP transmitter. Um, but there's some troubles with this one as well, as there's even more impulse piping and all the problems that may come with those impulse piping. And there's additional instrumentation costs and conduit and wiring costs as well. And you can triple the amount of commissioning and maintenance time. You can see here now that why this, this is just taking into consideration the density is not enough either. So in this situation, the K constant is assumed again. Um, although you're taking the differential pressure, static pressure, and process temperature measurements, you're only partially correcting for any changes in pressure and temperature. So you can see here um, the uh, better accuracy and percent error that you get when taking those three separate measurements. So in our first situation where we were only using a DP transmitter, um, in this uh, highly exaggerated error example, um, you can get up to 15% error if conditions are right. While taking a separate static pressure and process temperature measurement, you can get that percent error down to 2.5%. So like I mentioned, these are um, a little bit exaggerated, but these could happen um, in certain, in the perfect conditions. So what do we need to do to take into consideration all the changes in that K constant? Um, we need to look what really goes into that K constant. To get the full flow equation, um, there are many things that go into that K constant, and I have them listed here. Um, the compressibility factor um, based on the fluid, the discharge coefficient based on the orifice and the, the pipe, a gas expansion factor, and then the velocity of the fluid and the diameter of the pipe. And this all can be multiplied by the square root of a differential pressure and static pressure. So you can see here that all these different things that go into that K constant change with varying pressures and temperatures. And that's why it's, it's so important to take into consideration any pressure or temperature um, changes in your fluid. So how do you do this? How do you take into consideration all those different varying pressures and temperatures? You could do that by using a multivariable transmitter. So a multivariable transmitter solves a lot of your problems that you get with historical DP flow. Um, it can limit those pipe penetrations you get with the separate pressure and temperature measurements. It can reduce your wiring cost and reduce installation time. And you can standardize on one transmitter in a wide variety of applications. 
And multivariable transmitters, for those who don't use them, contain a differential pressure transmitter, a static pressure transmitter, and a process temperature transmitter all in one device. Not only does it contain all those um, different variables in the one device, it also contains a real-time fully compensated mass flow equation. So I pulled up that full equation on the, a couple of slides ago and showed you how pressures and temperatures uh, are changing in those varying uh, K factor coefficients. And all those are done inside the transmitter. So it makes your uh, measurement a lot more accurate than doing that in a flow computer. So you can see here the comparison of all the three different types of scenarios. The traditional DP scenario where you're just using a differential pressure transmitter. In this air example, you can get a 15% error. Um, when you add those two separate transmitters of a differential pressure transmitter and a temperature transmitter and a static pressure transmitter, uh, you could reduce that error to 2.5%. But when you use a multivariable transmitter with fully compensated flow calculations in the device, you can take that measurement uh, error down to 0.7%. So it really shows um, how much more accurate a multivariable transmitter with fully compensated uh, flow calculations can be over the traditional ways of taking DP flow measurements. So that's that's my first section. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Ned uh, to go a little bit more into uh, calibration and multivariable transmitters. All right. Hey, Nicole, that was great. Uh, really, uh, really a lot of good information. I uh, want to thank everybody today for joining us as well. Uh, really are excited to be presenting to you today. So we're going to change gears a little bit and uh, Nicole has explained a little bit how the transmitter works, so I want to talk about, you know, how do you maintain this nice transmitter that does all this fancy stuff? Um, and you know, going through this little list here, you know, you guys, our audience, you you you're continually pushing us vendors. You know, you want something that's more accurate. You want, uh, uh, you know, just something that's stable and so on and and we're trying to deliver uh, and you know with the technology improvements I think Nicole made a very good point on her last slide I mean you can really get some uh, highly accurate measurements uh, taking in extra variables here so you know so as a vendor and and really as a calibration technician you're di we're just trying to leverage this smart technology and the digital components and in a way, we're, make, we're trying to make things easier, but it's, it also seems a little more complicated. But, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is down here at the bottom is there's just more pressure on a maintenance guy or gal than ever before. It's just uh, as the technology gets uh, better and better, there's more things that you have to learn and understand. Uh, let's see. There we go. So this is a recap maybe from uh, our previous webinar we did a few months ago. Um, so just, just a recap, when you do a flow calibration, uh, keep in mind that the best way to meter flow is, and to test a flow meter is to, is to put it on a pipe and, and actually measure a precise amount of media going past that flow meter. So, uh, you know, many of you probably use flow laboratories or uh, utilize a laboratory in some way. Uh, you can also make your own test stand and, and maybe do a flow check yourself. And there's some other, you know, procedures maybe that you can utilize. Uh, so when you're doing DP flow, you're really checking the, you know, what the particular transmitter is capable of measuring and verifying that it's measuring accurately. But in the, even in this example, you need to maybe pull the orifice plate and take a look at it, make sure it's in good condition and, and so on. Because if there's something wrong with the orifice plate, it doesn't matter how good the transmitter is. But to recap what Nicole just presented, 
this is another representation of the multivariable that uh, we're going to be demonstrating today. It has three inputs, uh, differential, static pressure, and temperature. So you want to see how accurate is the, is the transmitter measuring these th three parameters. And as Nicole said, uh, they're crunched inside the transmitter through the transmitter's microprocessor and that little box there with flow calculation that has all the formula parameters in there and it calculates a mass flow or, and that's your 4 to 20 output. But notice, you know, via heart, the, the smart capability of the transmitter, you can view the DP parameter, the static pressure parameter, and the temperature parameter. So really, the way to test it is to see DP versus heart DP, static pressure versus the static pressure parameter, and then finally the temperature compensation versus what's that digital number. So these three heart numbers are what get plugged into the flow calculation that ultimately generates the 4 to 20 output. So how, you know, how can you test it? Uh, and what we have today is a, is a multivariable that is a combination of DP with compensation for, for temperature via an RTD and the static pressure is measured inside the capsule. So, uh, so this instrument is very accurate and we're trying to take the mystery out of it. So for testing, you're going to need uh, at least two types of pressure standards. You need one to measure inches of water, typical for differential pressure or millibar, and then you also need to measure the static pressure in the pipe uh, be able to meter that, and that's typically a, a, implies an absolute sensor. And then uh, uh, for the temperature side, you either it, what I like to recommend is using a dry block or a bath where you actually insert the probe into a standard. Uh, but today Roy is going to be using an RTD simulator just for speed and ease of uh, demonstration. And then, of course, you want to be able to check the milliamp output, and then if you want to trim it, make any adjustments, you're going to need a hard communicator. So I think that sets the stage for Roy, so I'm going to turn this over to Roy to show you what I'm talking about. All right, thank you, Ned. Let me just take the presentation here. Make sure I'm showing the right screen. There we go. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us in this multivariable presentation. So we've got a calibrator that we're going to calibrate this with, but if I look at it, there are no tags loaded yet. So I need to actually put my tags on here. I can do that in pretty short order. If I bring up my calibration software, I'll take my tag. I've got five different tests that we're about to see. We have two loop checks, which stay tuned for part two at the, the second half of this, but I have a differential pressure, a static pressure, and a temperature transmitter. That's what I'm going to do right now, but I need to load all these guys on. So let me send it over, and this could actually take a while. So we really, so just hang on one second while I disconnect this. This is our list. If I hit send, now we're going to send over all of the tags. Now we can fire this up. So on the calibrator, if I go to document and calibrator, all of my tests are listed. And I've got my two loop checks. And I put a number in front of the name so that I can have them in the exact order that I want them to appear. Otherwise, it would be listed alphabetically. And that's, that's also fine. But let me, let me do this. Let me grab another camera angle so you guys can see what is actually going on here. So this is the uh, calibration studio, in case anybody was wondering. Now, I've got the, uh, the MC6 sitting right here. This is my multivariable transmitter. And on the input, I've got a four-wire RTD setup. And normally we would put a, an actual temperature probe in a dry block to provide our process temperature. But if you follow these cables, we're going to go over here to another calibrator where I'm, I'm simulating the resistance value of the temperature that I want. And 
this is my pressure pump for when I get on to pressure. My hose is connected up to the pump. It's also connected to my multivariable transmitter on the high side. And then it's going into my calibrated standard, my pressure transducer right here on top of the calibrator. All right. Number one, let's do differential pressure. So if I click that, It'll show me where I'm going to hook up, and we're going to calibrate the differential pressure. And you can see on the bottom, I'm connecting to the heart digital variable of the differential pressure. So we're not taking milliamps into account on the back side of this transmitter. We will on our final test, but right now we're connecting to the, to the digital parameter. And this will be a 0 to 250 inches of water in and a 0 to 250 out. I wish there were a turbo button on heart. So it's finally here. It, it's shown up. Now we have zero in, and that's based on this. I've got this vented. Let me press the zero button on the bottom right. That'll zero out my pressure transducer, and we'll hit start and get going. I've got a four to five second delay set up on each test point, and you'll see gray bars that tells me where I'm going. So the bottom right is telling me where I'm heading. So this is about 25%. I went over just a little bit. But I don't have to get this thing dead on as far as 62.5. I can get it anywhere in the range. The calibrator will automatically calculate the output versus the input. And you can see the error on top of the graph. Let me let go again here. So I just actually exceeded it. So I can pull this back down. And I could have even forced it to take that point right there as well. It, it could have. So we're getting a zero error right now. So that means our differential pressure is dead on. The middle black line is zero as far as the input versus output. That means zero error. The blue lines represent our tolerance. I've got a tolerance of a half a percent of span. Now this, okay, it passed. We had zero error. This thing was dead on. I can hit the down arrows to look at our graph again or go to see the numbers itself. Let me save this. And I'll save it as found. All right. Now I'll, I'll hit back. So, and I'll hit the X to hop out of here. I've just tested one aspect of this multivariable. And before multivariable, as they mentioned, you are looking at differential. You're looking at static pressure and temperature all separately. So now we're going to grab our static pressure, which will be a separate test. We'll do a three up test. And we'll, we'll grab it 0 to 25 psi. The full range capability here is 0 to 800 PSIA, but with, with barometric pressure, sea level being 14.7 roughly, and the addition of the 250 inches of water, we'll never exceed 25 PSI on the input. So that's why I've chosen 0 to 25 PSI in this instance. So we're still connecting down here, you can see. Done. Now I'll hit start. Again, you can see a live error reading. You can see the countdown under force accept down here. So I'm doing the midpoint now. And I'm just applying pressure. There is some dampening going on here. And one thing I want you to note is we are not dead on the zero there well we have an issue looks like with our setting this thing needs to be trimmed a little bit or does it we're gonna find out the tolerance I have set up for this is two percent of span so I'm gonna stop it right here you can see where this thing is going and once it's done I'll show you the final graph so it passed, but let me arrow down to our graph so we can check out some numbers. This was about 1% error. And is 1% good or bad? The tolerance on everything else that I have here is, uh, Ned? You're going to trim this, right? I'm not going to trim this. Why not? It's out. Well, 
You know what? This thing is out if we're looking at a half a percent tolerance or even a one percent tolerance. This guy's a little bit out. We're, we are 1.07 percent, but we're going to show how this static pressure has a minimal effect on the full flow output calculation. So is that why you're using two percent as as opposed to something tighter? That's exactly why I'm using two percent. I could have went in here and, and actually trimmed this, and I don't want to take the time to actually trim this right now. We could. Let me come down here. We can see the the actual numbers. So yeah, we're the further out we go, the further off we are. And let me save this. I'll save this as found. And if I wanted to, I could come in here and click the secret button on the top left and choose start communicator. And then I could do the, the trimming methods that are built into this transmitter. Well, okay. thanks for bringing that up, Ned. All right, sounds good. So we've got our as found saved and we'll hit back. We've got one more to do. One more for this section anyway. So we've, we've done our differential pressure, we've done our static pressure, and now let's calibrate the temperature transmitter. I need to make one cable change. And I'm done. Okay, so the cable change is done. I just had to connect my uh, my RTD cables right here where the mouse is pointing so that the MC6 now is sourcing the simulated temperature, so RTD again being resistance, and I'm still connecting to the digital output signal for my temperature. The full range here is 0 to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The process temperature of this multivariable happens to be 78 degrees Fahrenheit. This, this process is water and it's discharged back into a river after it's been cleaned up. Here's my temperature, so I've got simulated temperature in and I'm measuring the digital value from the transmitter out. Let me hit start and we'll see what delay, yep, I've got a five second delay um, automatically on each one, each test point. So and this is a hands-free operation because the calibrator itself is simulating the input so with the pressure you have to either use a pump or a regulator or something to give it that pressure. So our error, we'll find out what our error is here. We're pretty darn close to, to zero. So we passed our maximum error is 0.03% of span. Now, so two of these things we tested are almost flat zero, but our static pressure was off by 1%. So what's that going to do to our, our main calculation? And I'm, I made a deliberate choice not to trim that. So here's our graph. Our maximum error, well, it was this point right here, 0.03%. Let me save this. So this is as found. I have just completed our first three tests. So let me turn this over to Sarah. Let's do our first Q&A. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Roy. Thank you. OK, so we're moving into our first Q&A session. And we've already received some great questions. And if you haven't already, Feel free to use the question box on the side of your screen to ask your questions to uh, our presenters here. So we'll go ahead and get this started off. Our first question is, is the MV transmitter really cost effective rather than three individual transmitters? And I believe he's saying multivariable transmitters. Yep. I can take this one. Um, so. It actually is a lot more cost effective. So if you take into consideration um, conduit costs, wiring costs, device costs, and even installation, uh, you can probably save about 70% depending on um, the measurement. Now if you're actually looking at the specific uh, transmitter costs, so the three separate devices and then a multivariable transmitter, it's about two to three hundred dollars less. Um, and then if you take into consideration wiring on that, you can save up to $1,000 on a multivariable transmitter. I didn't know that. OK, next question. Thank you, Nicole. When you overshoot the value, how far should you go back down so you do not lose the chance of seeing hysteresis? 
Wow, that's a great question. So, all right, so somebody busted me. <laughs> so when I overshoot, I usually come down about 50% between the, the previous test point. I'll come back about at the 50% point and then come back up, or the reverse. If I'm coming down and I overshoot it, I'll come back up and then come back down again. So about 50, about halfway between the next test point. What do you do, Ned? Yeah, I, I would do the same thing. But, right. but you could have demonstrated that today, and that transmitter it doesn't it doesn't really affect that one. It's kind of a it depends on the technology. It does. It does. Great question, though. Okay. Next question. Um, do you need to perform trims when uh, to the out, to the analog four to twenty output when performing a calibration? We're we're going to ask that question. How y'all do it out there? Um, if you do that, so um, in this for what we showed today, uh, you know, Roy demonstrated that the uh, the DP pressure was good and the temperature was good. He showed that the static pressure had a one percent error. So we haven't checked the milliamp output or the mass flow calculation yet on this transmitter. We just showed the, the three basic parameters. So uh, so in theory, if you trim that static, it should be putting out a good mass flow calculation. Yep, so I would calibrate the digital parameters. We'll answer that question maybe in part two here after uh, this question series, we'll get exactly you know to that point. All right, here's a stumper. Give me one disadvantage of a multivariable transmitter, being it is an all-in-one transmitter. Well, uh, being the product person, I don't want to say there's any disadvantage, but. Uh, <laughs> um, I think if you you know lose have your fa have a failure, um, you could lose potentially your whole flow measurement. It probably is one big disadvantage of a multivariable transmitter. It's logical. Um, here we have Roy. I didn't see the heart communicator. Is it embedded in the calibrator? It is embedded in the calibrator, and I I didn't. I could have pressed one more button to bring that up, but then we would have had to wait for the heart sequence to, to fire up. But yes, built in. And one last question here, and then we will turn it over to back to Katie. And any other questions, we will follow up in the second question and answer uh, portion. And that question is, how can you tell if your transmitter measures absolute gauge or static pressure? Um, one of the, you know one of these things are you have to take into consideration what you you order, um, and you'd have to look at like the model code on the tag of the transmitter to uh, determine if it was uh, gauge or absolute. So yes, and you can use the engineering software to plug into it using the heart modem to find out. But let me show you physically how you can tell if you have one, because I have one or the other. Let me plug in this alternate webcam. I hope the lighting is okay. But down here on the bottom, this actually, I don't know if I can get this, these two rivets right here say vent. And that means that this is a gauge transmitter. If this were an absolute transmitter, it would not have that uh, those rivets and say vent. And that would impact how you test the static pressure. If it's a yeah. if it's a gauge sensor like Roy has, you should really just test it in gauge mode. Um, if it's obviously in static, then you would want to test it in absolute mode. Alrighty. Well, we have a few more questions that just came in, but we will follow up on those in the second question and answer section. So hold tight. We'll get to you shortly. Till then, I'm going to hand it back over to Katie.
Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, before I send it back over to Nicole to continue on with the presentation, I just wanted to let you know um, if you are interested in reading weekly articles all about calibration, um, BMAX does offer a technical blog called Calibration Insights, um, and you can subscribe to that by visiting blog dot bmex dot com and you'll get notifications every time a new um, blog is post posted but you don't have to subscribe you can also just go visit it from time to time to see all the new articles that are up uh, the most recent ones were about how to um, proof test and also all about calibration uncertainty so with that I will hand it back over to Nicole to continue on all right, thanks, Katie. So now in the second section of the webinar here, um, I'm going to go through um, some more myths about multivariable. Um, one of the biggest things I've heard, I'll wait for my mouse to catch up here. One of the biggest things I've heard is that uh, overall multivariable is too complex to use. So um, over the past 10 or so years, there have been many advances advancements in multivariable transmitters. Um, and so hopefully we can go through um, in these next couple slides how some advanced performance classes have helped make multivariable a little uh, easier to use um, and how it's not really necessary to compensate all the time. And then some more detail into um, impulse piping and um, how to prevent using impulse piping and then um, some more calibration uh, information on how to make multivariable a little bit more easier. So uh, I pu pulled this uh, flow equation up before, and here you can really see the breakdown of all the different things that vary uh, with pressure and temperatures and flow rates. So as we discussed before, before it's really important to compensate for all these different variables in the K factor in the mass flow equation. Um, and if you don't do this inside the transmitter, you typically do it in a flow computer. Um, usually uh, this is uh, pretty complex to program and set up, and it usually requires somebody with uh, a lot of experience in doing this to get the most accurate uh, measurement. The nice thing about multivariable transmitters is a lot of times, uh, I think all, all the time actually, there's a, some sort of software program that helps uh, simplify the complexity of that, this mass flow equation. So you're going to have a lot of different fluids, um, maybe a lot of different primary elements and a lot of different standards uh, that you also have to take in consider, into consideration and they also might fa uh, factor into your accuracy and give you a uh, different accuracy reading on your transmitter. So what these uh, software programs can do is with just taking your process fluid, your primary element type, and your line size, uh, the device will calculate all the information you need um, for you. And it makes the multivariable transmitter really easy to use um, instead of having to program that into a flow computer. So not only has there been a lot of advancements in um, the full flow equation and the fully compensated flow calculations in the multivariable transmitter, but there's been a lot of advancements in um, the sensor modules that the multivariable transmitters have. Um, you can use the transmitter in a wide variety of applications because there's so many different differential pressure ranges and static pressure ranges. Um, the sensors a lot of times also have uh, built-in um, uh, internal temperature measurements to prevent from ambient temperature effect, and this can really uh, reduce any um, error you might typically get with any other transmitters. So talking a little bit more of performance, performance of a, a multivariable transmitter. Historically, the objective in any transmitter has, to, uh, has been to increase the performance as a percent of span. But those advancements in the sensor uh, technology of multivariable transmitters have allowed for two main categories of performance classes. Those two main categories are the typical percent of span and then a percent of reading transmitters. So what a percent of reading transmitter does is add a wide variety of flow ranges and at low flow turndowns, um, you can get a high accuracy measurement. So you can see on the graph on the right, 
um, with that percent of reading transmitter, you can even get um, below a one uh, an, uh, a low error um, at those low flow rates. So going into a little bit more depth, um, here's just one example of a percent of reading transmitter versus a percent of span transmitter. So in a percent of uh, reading transmitter at DP is at 1,000 inches of water, you're going to get a, a good error of 0 .04%. 0 .04%. Um, and then as you get into uh, DP readings of 200 inches of water, 25 inches of water, your uh, percent error increases as you get into those lower flow rates. While in a percent of um, reading transmitter at that 1,000 1, inches of water, you're going to keep that 0.04% of error and then you're going to um, keep that 0.04% of error at your 200 inches of water as well. So you can see here the real benefits of using a percent of reading uh, transmitter. And those sensor uh, modules really allow for this in multivariable transmitters. So, um, you know, not everybody may need a percent of reading transmitter, but uh, those transmitters can be used in a wide variety of applications. Uh, say, for example, you have uh, a stacked transmitters all in a row. Um, one transmitter can cover many of those different flow, flow ranges. Um, or if you have to switch orifice plates uh, with seasonal varying flows. Um, and then I've listed a couple other ones here. Um, you can read those through on the slide, but maybe if you have to operate um, your flow meters at below 33% of the maximum flow. So it's a, the percent of reading multivariable transmitters really a good opportunity to maintain your accuracy at a wide variety of flow rates. So um, one other myth uh, I'd like to debunk is um, that you must fully compensate all your measurements when using a multivariable transmitter. So I know I talked a lot about that in the earlier slides, is that you must always have a differential pressure static and process temperature measurement. Well, um, in fact, I um, that's technically not true. So say if you don't have a, a lot of varying pressures and temperatures, you can choose different measurements to go with that. So say if you have a liquid or saturated steam that doesn't change with static pressure that much, uh, some multivariable transmitters have the option uh, to just have a differential pressure and process temperature measurement. Um, and this can even reduce your costs even more. Um, and still maintain those high accuracies of having all three measurements in one. So it's another good opportunity for cost savings here. So here's kind of a summary of what multivariable transmitters have. There's so much, uh, so much flexibility with a multivariable transmitter. Um, you can uh, just have a, a differential measurement with your flow calculations, depending on your fluid application, or you can have all three measurements in one. Um, you can add it to varying um, uh, remote seals or a flow meter. And then one other side note here is you don't even have to use a multivariable transmitter in a flow application. You, you can also use it when you have a simple static pressure and process temperature measurement right next to each other. And that can reduce, um, that can reduce uh, wiring costs as well when using those measurements. So one other great thing about multivariable transmitters is that you don't always have to use impulse piping when using them. Um, a lot of them come with some integrated flow meters and this can also um, improve, improve your accuracy even more. Um, it can save you time and money on installation um, when you use the integrated flow meter. Um, and it can even reduce the weight of your device. So if that's a concern um, with you at all, uh, having an integrated flow meter with a multivariable transmitter attached to it um, is a really a great option to reduce some of those historical perspectives that you might have of DP flow. So all in all here, um, you know, multivariable transmitters don't have to be as complex as you might think they are. Um, you really only have to measure three different parameters, a process fluid, a primary element type, and a line size. And then um, the transmitter can measure uh, differential pressure, static pressure, and process temperature, and calculate a bunch of different variables. And then you as the user are able to get uh, done a bunch of different parameters, such as 
the mass flow, energy flow, totalized flow, and then all your different variables. So the multivariable transmitter um, does not have to be complex, um, and it can give you a lot of different information in one device. And so now I'm going to pass it back to Ned for a poll question. All right, thank you, Nicole. That was great. So we're going to go back to calibration here on this transmitter. We'd like to know, you know, the audience out there, how do you guys calibrate your transmitter? Uh, so it's about three quarters of the audience has multivariable. So you know, some of you that has have a few may say never. Uh, are you doing the way Roy showed the three methods? And I, I know at least one person is mapping a parameter milliamps and testing it that way. So if you're doing the third choice there, you know who you are, or maybe if you're sending them off to a flow lab, that would be other. So let's see. So a good many of you are, are using the, the, uh, the method that Roy just showed in the part one, and um, some of you are not doing it, so hopefully you'll learn today maybe how to take on calibration and uh, let's talk about those that are doing this mapping business uh, I'm going to show you maybe a different way that you can work so uh, so as I said you know we're sort of uh, shown we showed earlier uh, how you can test each of these components individually where you're looking at this measured input versus the heart value, this measured static pressure versus the heart value, and then the temperature versus the heart value. If, for those of you that are going in with your communicator and mapping each parameter, you're mapping the DP to the milliamps and checking it, and then you map the static to the milliamps and check it. You know, I say this really is not the best way to do it. You're, you're kind of messing with the transmitter. And if you don't set things back correctly, you could cause some problems. Uh, so I feel like the, the risk or uh, cost of making a mistake is not worth doing that. And really, the 4 to 20 output versus DP has nothing to do with what's going on with the flow calculation. So I just, I just don't think it's a good way to go. Um, so as an, as an alternate, one idea we want to present is, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with three variables, and if, if two of these could be set to a constant, then you could test, you know, the one input versus the 4 to 20 output. So the idea is, is that if you vent the transmitter, you're going to have a constant static pressure, and it's going to be around 14.7 if you're near sea level. Now, Roy's up in Denver. He's actually using 12.5 at his elevation. Here in Atlanta, I'd probably use something like 14.3, or no, 13 and a half. I'd probably use about 13 and a half. But, uh, and then if you can go with a constant temperature, and I would use a temperature that rep is representative of your process. So Roy had mentioned 78 degrees. So if you just can simulate or use a dry block, set at 78 degrees, great. If you're doing steam, I would use like 450 degrees Fahrenheit because that's pretty much what steam is running at in, in your process. So, so by taking those two variables as a fixed, you can then check the DP versus the milliamps, but there is a quirk there in that it's, it's a nonlinear relationship. Um, and remember what I said earlier about a flow meter, you know, we're kind of, we're getting out of the word calibration because we really can't trim this way. We have to trim the individual components. So we're kind of verifying that the transmitter is operating correctly. And let's see, I always have trouble making this advance. There we go. So, one of the things I would encourage you to do is to get with your vendor and try to develop a table like this. So this is just something I did in Excel. But the transmitter Roy has, it, will, it can measure up to uh, an output of a calculated output rate of 83,500 kilograms per hour. So that at, 
at zero, it's four milliamps. At 83,500, it's going to output 20 milliamps. And then here's your uh, static pressure. So Roy's table is set up with 12.5, but I'm showing 14.7 since probably most of you are close to that pressure. And then, uh, so here's the constant 78. We're going to say, okay, for this test, we're just going to have a constant 78 degrees. We're going to start with a static pressure at 14.7, which is vented. But then as we go over the range of the transmitter up to 250 inches, the, the inches of water that's being generated or by the pump adds to the static pressure so I just did a conversion to add this test point in PSIA to the base error here or base pressure. So with this assumption of, of these three conditions we can expect the transmitter to go to read from 0 to 83,900 actually is the math on this for its formula but I calculated the exact milliamps that you should get out of the transmitter under these conditions. So, and one thing that Roy and I did is we also included the test points of 62.5, which is 25%, and we also put in 187.5, which is uh, 3 quarters. So our test points are, are on this table, but we also have the intermediate points as well. And if we look at this graphically, here's the graph. So uh, it, you can see it's not too bad. In fact, it's pretty linear here from uh, about 50 inches upwards. But, um, you know, we're used to testing things in a linear manner. So we would expect here at uh, 125 inches of water to be at 12 milliamps. Well, in this case, it's going to be something like 16 milliamps or whatever. So, so, uh, so the tools that we have uh, with with what Roy is using, we can actually put that table into the calibrator and uh, evaluate the error along this nonlinear line. So, uh, so let's see, uh, let's see what Roy can demonstrate here. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Roy. I'm, I'm just trying to fire up my heater. It's uh, supposed to, you know, snow here. How do we turn this? Okay, so it is a little bit cold here. I am in Colorado, and it's supposed to be snowing at any second. So... Sometimes we have to calibrate even in the cold, and I'm, you got your hard hat, but sometimes you need a little more warmth on your hard hat. So I do need to share my screen, don't I? Does this make it actually hard to concentrate? It's making it kind of hard for me. Number one. The graph that, that Ned just showed, and actually, uh, I think I'm, I don't need this right now. The graph that Ned showed had these test points, 0, 25, 50, 62 and a half, and we were able to plug this into the calibrator itself and plug it into the software also. That's how we're getting these numbers. But I also want to point out that these numbers are available. If you own one of these, you'll be able to get that information from the factory, wherever you purchase your multivariable. You'll describe the process. You'll describe uh, the pipe diameter, and you'll have things such as the absolute viscosity, the compressibility, at flow. Um, that's actually not the one I wanted. I wanted this one. So gas expansion factor, discharge coefficient, thermal expansion effects. And so all this stuff is taken into account, and that's where we got these numbers. So you can either get the calculator from the manufacturer themselves, or you can plot all this out. And lucky, luckily for me, I have Ned, and Ned did it for me. Thank you, Ned. He is my math whiz. So on the calibrator, let me just go to meter real quick and check out our barometric pressure. Normally it is somewhere around 12.5, but we have a, a low pressure coming in. Yesterday it was 12.07 PSI, so snow was on the way. 
back to the home screen. Documenting calibrator. Ned, did you care if I do the PV next or the? I'd like to do that one next if that's all right. Sure, Roy. I, I think just show both of them. You'll make some good points. All right. I will show both of them. So I have my 78 degrees being sourced. We're connecting now to the heart mass flow output digital parameter. So that's what we're hooking up to. So we did all these things to calibrate uh, the input parameters, and now we're going to look at the output. And the next one I'm going to do will actually be the milliamp output. But first, I want to see the actual digital variable that will be going off to the DCS. Your DCS will be showing a certain uh, kilograms per hour. Now, in this example, I used – I've got pressure on here. On this example, I used a, a mass flow. You could absolutely use a volumetric flow. That's okay, too. And uh, I'm using water. Water has less variables as far as uh, temperature and pressure, so the density of the, fl of the fluid or the content changes less. So I kind of used water on purpose. Here we go. I'm going to hit start. We have zero. All right. Now, everyone knows I should have actually pressed the zero button, right, to zero out my transducer. Let me actually do that. I'm going to do pause, reject the cal, and then I'm going to hit the zero button to zero out my pressure transducer, and now I'll hit start. And one thing I noticed with this, because of the ambient uh, air pressure here, it's waiting for a stable signal before it counts down, so it took a little bit longer, and now you're seeing it count down from five. And you'll see I'm closing my vent, and I'll take it up to my next test point, which is actually 62.34. Really, and I overshoot it. And everyone knows that I really could have went down farther and then come back up to it, but I'm going to leave it here just for the sake of time. And with this digital transmitter, we're not going to see a huge amount of error. But the error that we're seeing right now is, is negative 0.04%. 0.04% error. So the top right, we are seeing our mass flow. We're seeing our actual flow in kilograms per hour. 59, 098, 5900, okay. So this is our loop check. And Ned mentioned this earlier. And how, how are you testing or how are you calibrating this transmitter? Are you doing all three steps like I did before? What Ned is suggesting is, as a complete loop check, why don't you do this or the next one I'm about to show you. And then if this is off or outside of your parameters, then dive in and check out the static pressure and the differential pressure and the temperature. Okay, we passed. I'm going to show you one thing. Everyone, get out your photographic memories. Memorize this graph. The shape, okay, it is pretty flat, so it shouldn't be too hard. And I'm thinking if we had a little bit of a delay, we might have uh, even got closer on this 25% uh, test point. Let's save this. I'm saving it as found. And again, if I needed to, I could go right into the heart communicator by choosing start communicator, and it would fire right up, but we're not going to do that for time. I'll go back out of here, back to my list of calibrations. We can see that I've done four calibrations. There's a green check mark next to each one of them. Now the final one. And this might even be the only one you even do. We're checking the differential or pressure in and mass flow out as far as 4 to 20 milliamps. So 0 to 249.358 inches in, 4 to 20 milliamps out. Loop power is on. We're using a special transfer function. I'm letting it stabilize, just giving it a, a second. And before I do hit start, I am vented on my pump, so I'll hit zero. And now start. So you're seeing the milliamp output. So for those of you who want to see the 4 to 20 output of this multivariable transmitter, you are witnessing that right now. So you might have thought this was impossible to do, but you're seeing it.
So everybody knows that I was about 1% off with my static pressure measurement, and I told you I'm not trimming it. I am not going to trim that. And what is this showing you? This shows you the static pressure on this liquid water does not make as big of a difference on the full calculation of flow. That's what you're seeing. So just because you can measure something down to the micro ounce or whatever doesn't mean you need to trim it to that. Trim based on what your process needs. Okay, we passed. Let's take one more look at that graph. Is our flow okay? Yes. Did we have to check the individual static, differential, and temperature? No, we didn't have to. We could have done this test and then walked on and done the next one as long as we recorded this value. Ned, do you have anything Roy, else to add on that? Roy, that was just very cool. Um, so what you demonstrated, and you and I didn't really know this, is that you know a 1% error in the static has a very negligible effect here. That's um, true. There, there is one weakness in this approach. We are simulating a temperature close to the process, but we're not really simulating, we're not doing the test at the normal static pressure. That would be ideal. Um, so that it could be that you should check the at least do this test and maybe at least check the static if you have a significantly higher static pressure. Well, I, I ran the numbers, Ned, and even so these these are all the calculations based on twelve point five PSI. And I was gonna do that, but what I did is I compared them against fourteen point seven and the difference in the flow was a point one in kilograms per hour. So it was so infinitesimal, it was so tiny that I don't, I don't think that that's going to cause us any well, heartburn. But for this application, we're also simulating a 20 PSIA static as you go from 0 to 100% there. That 250 True. inches takes it up. But what I'm saying is what if you're testing at, what if your normal static pressure is much higher, like at 50 PSIA or 100 PSIA gas in a pipe? You might want to check that static element because we're, we're vented to atmosphere. Uh, we're not representative of of your process. All right, that's a great point. I had liquid on the brain, and well, that actually didn't sound good, did it? I had a, a liquid material in mind, but a, a gas, it would be much more. There'd be much more variation. So, but, excellent but, point. And with no, that, I think I would have an absolute yeah. uh, pressure module on my transmitter instead of a gauge, just so I didn't have to deal with that. Yeah, that I think would be more accurate too. No, as long as what I would say is you could do these tests and you'll learn how important it is. And, uh, you know, so you, at the very least, you could do the three tests and, and just document everything. That's true. What I'm saying is, is if you do this, this sort of verification test to start, if you're getting a flat line like this, why waste time testing the other parameters? You know they're in good shape. So, That's true. so it's a time it's a time saver this kind of approach. Yeah, and it brings milliamps into the into the test where the other test you're not really you know you're not really checking the milliamps. So I like it because it's kind of like Back to the Future. It's it's inches of water versus milliamps. It's nonlinear though. But, um, Good. You know what? I think that's the first thing you've ever said you've liked about anything I've ever done. Yeah, good job. So, I'm just going to hold on to that, so thank you. Okay. So now let's do part two of our Q&A. Sarah. I really don't want to break up that love fest that was just going <laughs> on. Really? <laughs> All righty. And uh, I believe, Katie, did you have something for us before we moved into questions? Yes, I sure did. Before we start the question and answer session, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that ISA does offer training courses. Um, they can come on site or you can go to their facility. And they do have two that are pretty relevant to what we've been talking about here today. One is calibration assets 
management and data acquisition best practices. And another one is installing, calibrating, and maintaining electronic instruments. Um, they have both of those courses actually scheduled in December. So check their website, isa.org forward slash training if you're interested in those. Alrighty, time for questions. And uh, we still have questions coming in, so we're going to try to address all of them now. But if we don't, don't worry, we will email you after the webinar and answer your question. Um, or if no, we I just have one comment. Why do we have this image? Does this mean that everybody that just went through what we just presented is feeling like that? That's how that I guy looks pretty frustrated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, well, let's, let's um, relieve them from feeling that way. How about that? Okay. Uh, with the first question, we have a viewer here with a Modbus transmitter that has four wires to communicate with Flowboss instead of the two-wire heart transmitter that we're using as an example. And he would like to know what is new in this model for communication. Yeah, so I think... Um, Oh, were you talking then? No, go ahead. I'll let you start. So I, I think you kind of said it in your question there. The big thing is um, the, the device we're talking about here is a heart transmitter, which is two-wire. Um, and then transmitters like Modbus or Fieldbus have the four wires uh, for power and communication. Um, Ned, did you have more to add? Well, I was going to ask, is Modbus implying that it's a flow computer and there's three components, or is it a single measuring element like a multivariable. Hmm. Hmm. Well, maybe, um, Arfin, if you, after the webinar, if you want to email and help us understand that question a little better, please do, so we can answer that for you. Or if what Roy did, you could, you could key in the Modbus reading, since uh, a communicator or whatever can't read it, but you could key in that reading and, and do the same, same kind of testing. Okay. So moving all right along here, uh, can the heart be used in a series with external power supply? Well, heart's just riding on the 4 to 20 signal, so you're measuring it with a communicator in parallel. So Roy's device, the modem's built inside, but it, it's connecting in parallel to the, uh, the 4 to 20 signal. Um, how does a DP flow meter compare to a mag meter as far as accuracy goes? We need our previous uh, presenter, our flow expert. <laughs> I would say it depends on the application. Um, the, you know, there's going to be applications where the multivariable excels, and then there's going to be applications where a mag meter would be a better choice. And maybe we can yeah. forward the question on to our previous presenter. Nicole, I mean, do you what, yeah, where does the multivariable feed out of uh, mag meter? Yeah, DP flow meters or multivariable uh, flow meters have been uh, really accurate um, in the past uh, couple of years, and you can uh, get like a half a percent accuracy when installed. Um, but uh, mag meters perform well in like certain fluids like water, um, but sometimes have trouble with uh, non-conductive fluids or slurries. Um, so it really depends on the you know fluid and the uh, application that you have for accuracy. Okay. Moving right along, besides price, what would be uh, the selling points for a multivariable pressure transmitter over a Coriolis meter? Well, if price is no well, option, um, I all Coriolis, <laughs> right? If it works in the application, but that's a big price to swallow, right? Hmm. 
Nicole, did you want to follow yeah, that and they, Yeah, so um, it depends, you know, on the application again. It, it can't really do uh, gas or steams as well. Um, you might get some high permanent pressure loss um, and can be really large and large line sizes. So, um, you know, depends on all those things um, with Coriolis and DP flow, so. If you use a multivariable transmitter for additional variables without using it for flow, how do you receive multiple analog inputs via 4 to 20? Um, so in this in this case, you'll have to use a heart to analog converter, um, you know, maybe a tri loop or something like that. Um, but that that way, you can use the 4 to 20 and get um, any variables or additional variables um, using that. And y'all interrupt me if I move on to the next question too quickly. Um, Ned, I believe this next question was based on your slide 44 on vendor provided information. Um, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong here, but would the milliamp output not be square rooted? Yeah, there's no square root that the, the conversion is done in the multivariable so on my table that I showed, I just took that 0 to 83,500, divided that and multiplied it times, you know, with the percent step it was, times 16 for milliamp span and added the 4. So it just calculated the equivalent milliamps for that calculated flow rate. There, there's no, the square root's already been done to get to that flow rate number. That makes sense. Yep. Do you recommend using a low flow cutoff? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, Nicole kind of alluded to it when she talked about having multiple transmitters on the line. You, you they, and and her graph showed that the accuracy opens up at the low end. So if you have uh, a second or even third transmitter in the line, they can sort of cascade. Uh, you can have one turn down way low to catch the flow when it's low and one kind of medium and then one kind of high. And you'll get really super accurate measurements across the, the range low. Uh, and if you remember my graph, it really jumped from zero to uh, at zero to 50 inches, so we're, which is what, 20%. The first 20%, it's got a real steep curve, if you recall, and then it kind of got pretty linear. So, so yeah, there's an accuracy measurement drop off at the low end that you should consider for your application more than, but, but also, but for testing, that's not a problem. Uh, since square root's not involved, it's a very stable input versus output as you go along. So the low flow cutoff is not that big a deal for as far as calibration goes. Okay. So next question. This one is, Roy, what do you recommend wearing if it's very hot weather? <laughs> Can I even say that? I don't, I don't. Or will you show us what you have to Yeah, I think I have to get the answer run by legal first. So I'm just going to... What's the next question? <laughs> okay, next question. Roy, this one was to you um, as well. A little bit more appropriate. And this came during your last demo. And it says, did you load the chart in the calibrator or did you just enter the full-scale value? And you wrote specifically kilograms per hour. So... We actually entered the chart within our calibration software and then it just transferred over to the calibrator. So that curve was already loaded. I could have loaded it on the calibrator by hand, but I had pre-made it in the software. So either way would work. So we have the ranges, the input high, low, the output high, low, and then that transfer curve that we had to customize. Because it's, it's not linear and it's not square root. 
I hope that answered the question. We'll see. Send us an email if that didn't answer your question, Stan. Okay, so how can I simulate temperature if I cannot remove RTD? We use Rosemont multivariable transmitters. Good question. Yeah, so um, I definitely love to go into more detail about Rosemont specific stuff, but um, maybe that can be an offline conversation. Um, but it is possible and usually in the um, configuration software um, to be able to do. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I think it's device specific uh, in that situation. And I'll just so, add in, so on that configuration, you can force it to be at a certain temperature for the calculations, for the mass flow calculations. Is that what you were referring to? Yep, yep. Yeah. Also, just an idea, but um, 78 degrees was 110 ohms, right, Roy? So you. That's true. You used to, you could use a resistor across the leads to do, you know, a resistance that's representative of the temperature you're trying to do. So yeah, so to actually to test that, I had two 220 ohm resistors that I twisted into parallel, which gave me 110 ohms, which is pretty darn close to 78 degrees. So I was using this in part of my testing. Okay. We still have great questions coming in, and I'm going to try to monitor the time we've used, but Katie, please uh, stop me if I'm running over here. Um, let's see, N Nicole, the next one's for you, and, and it says, will these multivariable transmitters be offered with backlighting? Um, <laughs> Uh, they could potentially be if there's a, a large uh, business case or something like that. If there's a bit huge need, I think um, that might be the direction they might go in the future. Um, uh, but I can't say as of now. Okay. All right. Wouldn't the multiple points being captured be able to be used for troubleshooting if history is being kept by the DCS? Well, yeah, I mean, you could uh, go into a history log and and, uh, and take a look at that, but you're not really calibrating, so I'm not sure of the question. I mean, calibration is testing, you know, a, a measurement versus a known standard, so we're trying to connect to this multivariable and, and uh, all the measurements and simulations are all traceable to NIST in this case. Okay. This person says, I believe they joined us for our first webinar, uh, he said, if I remember from last time, flow is not accurate below 10% due to the square root. Does this apply to the multivariable or can we go a little bit lower for the low flow cutoff, say 5%? I don't know, Nicole, you want to answer that? I mean, the square root, we're not having to deal with the square root phenomenon it's all done mathematically, so it, it, it moves very linear. The milliamps moves very linear as you go from zero to five, you know, to one percent, to and so on. Well, I think you would have to you would have to calculate all of those points up to that because that's the huge curve. We saw something similar to a square root. It wasn't exactly, but the first twenty five percent of input was fifty percent flow. So I think you are going to see a similar scenario. Nicole, when, you're, when you were showing the percent of reading and, and percent of span, the, the second to last point was like a half percent on the percent of reading, and then it really opened up, right? Yep, yep, that's correct. So, I mean, you can get down near five percent um, on those uh, percent of reading transmitters. Oh, you so you can test it below that. But keep in mind that it's not very accurate because <laughs> you're just you're down in the very lowest part of the transmitter. It's just not. So you're having the same problem. You're just not seeing the jumpy signal like you would with a differential with square root extraction. It's not jumping around. In this case, it's just not very accurate. That. Yeah. So yep. It's still there. It's just not in your face like it would be with a. 
an old style DP with square root extraction. And we've got one last question here and then I'm going to cut it off and any other questions that we haven't seen or if you think of other questions later on, um, you'll have a chance to send them to the presenters personally. So last question, uh, how significant is specific gravity on natural gas flow meters? Um, well, I mean, specific gravity is pretty important when it comes to that density term. Um, so uh, it's important to take in that into consideration. I know Roy or Ned, do you have more details? That's about all I have. Yeah, this is more. This is more of a Rosemont type question. It, when you compress gas, Nicole, how's that affect? You know. Specific gravity is where you start, but then when you compress it, it's going to be more significant with gas, the, the static pressure component of the equation, right? Yeah, yep. Um, that's uh, really important. Um, I, I'm not sure, um, you know, on the full details of that, but I know if you are uh, compensating for the pressure and temperature, um, it can reduce um, any of those those effects. So I would say for what Roy showed today, the, the static pressure didn't affect it much and we were working very near atmospheric pressure but in a gas pipeline it might be much more, the static pressure might be much more relevant than what we demonstrated today. So. Yes and those are taken into account when you use one of those uh, vendor calculators. So those numbers will be taken into account. Yeah. Can I say one thing? So I see that Chris is online. And Chris, last time at our ISA calibration conference at the ISA headquarters, you left something behind. And so there, this. Mm -hmm. So we were doing, uh, what was that, at the Blue Note. So you left your drumsticks behind when you play drums at the open mic night. So I got them right here. Come to Colorado, get them, and um, we should be good. <laughs> or we might just have to send Roy down there. To visit All right, Chris. I will go to Florida. I'll do that. <laughs> okay, thanks guys for sharing, and I hope you don't mind if we share your personal emails so that they can ask you more questions later on. Katie, what do you have for us? All right, guys, I'm about ready to wrap up the session for today and want to thank all of our presenters for doing an excellent job and thank all of you out there for spending some time with us and we hope we um, demystified a few things and answered some of your questions. One last quick promo, um, there are a couple additional resources that you uh, might be interested in. There's a book that you can buy through ISA if you go to ISA the bookstore. Um, industrial Flow Measurement. It's by Mr. David Spitzer. It's uh, 443 pages and all, all about flow measurement. Um, BMX does offer a free calibration resource, Ultimate Calibration 2nd Edition, and you can find that on our website. It's 203 pages all about calibration. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Sarah to close out for the day. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so you guys had a lot of great questions, and I actually have a question for you, and that is, what do you want to see on our next webinar? Uh, we'd love to present on what you're curious about as far as calibration and automation goes. So we will send you out a survey in an email following this webinar, so please take your time to fill that out. Give us feedback and uh, let us know what your great idea is. Also, if you missed any portion of this webinar, we will be sending out a link of the recorded version as well as some supporting information. So keep an eye on your inbox for both of those links and emails. Um, and like I mentioned before, if you have questions that weren't answered or you have a question later on, uh, please feel free to email your presenters and you've got their personal emails right there on your screen. So write them down and uh, that concludes the webinar. So thank you for attending. You've been a wonderful audience, and we hope to see you next time.